Today, we will be looking at a case that rocked South Africa in 2004, the kidnapping and murder of Lee Matthews, a university student from Johannesburg. Lee was born on 8th July 1983 to Rob and Sharon Matthews. She had one sibling, her sister Karen. The family would have celebrated Lee's 21st birthday the day after she was kidnapped. Rob says his fondest memory of her was how helpful she was. She was very conservative, quiet and a homebody. She was a model child. When Lee arrived at Bond University on the morning of the 9th, she realized she had her mum's credit card in her purse. She sent Sharon a text message to inform her. They arranged that her mum would come to campus to fetch the card. Bond University had access control with a security boom at the entrance, so the plan was for Lee to meet Sharon at the gate after her class at 10 a.m. A fellow student saw Lee walking to her car in her usual parking spot, and a moment later, another student spotted her talking to a man. This was the last time anyone ever saw Lee Matthews alive. Sharon arrived just after 10 a.m., but there was no sign of Lee. She waited for 20 minutes, and when Lee didn't show up, she called her, but her phone was off. This was very unusual. Sharon called her husband Rob and told him what was going on, and he tried to calm her down, assuming it was only a misunderstanding. At 11 a.m., two of Lee's friends were waiting for her at a shopping mall nearby. They had plans to buy a present for someone and then have lunch together, but Lee never showed up. As the morning passed and Lee had not been in touch, both her parents grew concerned. Sharon tried to call Lee several times, but her phone was off. When she finally saw an incoming call from her daughter, she was beyond relieved. A male's voice on the other end said that he had taken Lee. At first, Sharon thought it was a joke, something to do with the pirate-themed party the following evening. Lee had planned the whole event down to the last detail, and it wouldn't have surprised Sharon if she kicked off celebrations with a stunt the day before the actual party. But she soon realized that this was no joke. The kidnapper said that he was Libyan, and this wasn't his first kidnap for ransom, so he knew what he was doing. He would not hesitate to kill a daughter if she didn't comply. Sharon called Rob to add him into the conversation. The abductor spelled out his ransom demand, asking for 300,000 rands. At the time, this was about $50,000. He was commanding and seemed in control of the situation. They did not doubt for a second that he was serious. Rob and Sharon begged the kidnapper to have mercy on their daughter. They explained that it was the day before her 21st birthday party and said they would do anything to get her home in time. He hung up without any further discussion. Rob Matthews was beside himself. He knew he needed some help, but didn't want to do anything to endanger his daughter's life. He contacted a private investigator who encouraged him to go to the police. Bear in mind, crime in South Africa is rife and the police force is crippled with the sheer volume of cases coming their way every day. The fact that Rob did not go straight to police is not suspicious at all. He was just looking for the best, fastest way of getting help. Sharon saw another call come in from Lee's phone. This time, Lee was speaking. Sharon recalled that Lee sounded different like she had been drugged. But in later years, she concluded that her daughter was just petrified and had probably been crying heavily. Lee said she was okay. She begged her parents not to involve the police. She said that her dad had to be careful because the kidnapper had a gun and he had threatened to use it if needed. But it was too late. On the advice of the PI, Rob had gone to Johannesburg Central Police Station. Police prioritized Lee's case and a task force was assembled as kidnapping is considered a serious crime, even in a society where violent crime is commonplace. The clock was ticking. Nine hours had passed since Lee was last seen at Bond University. Then at 7 p.m., the kidnapper called again. He was clearly agitated about not getting the full amount he had asked for, but agreed that he would take it. In the conversation, 
It came out that Lee told him her parents weren't wealthy and they wouldn't be able to pay the full amount. Perhaps he felt he'd take whatever he could get. Rob Matthews followed the abductor's instructions. With the money in an unmarked envelope, he drove to the Grasmere Toll Plaza, south of the city, where he was supposed to stop on a flyover at 8 p.m. and flash his headlights three times. A police officer hid in the back of his Chrysler Voyager, but as they approached the meeting point, Rob became nervous. He dropped the police officer off at a gas station because he didn't want to jeopardize Lee's safety. In the stress of the moment, Rob misunderstood the kidnapper's directions and missed the bridge. The kidnapper, who must have been watching, called him and told him to turn around and stop on the other side of the road. Rob reached the location and pulled over on the shoulder of the way. A man came up behind him at the back window and ordered him to drop the envelope containing the money on the ground. Rob complied. The person ran away, and Rob was sure he would see his daughter again soon. Rob drove around, hoping to hear from the kidnapper again. He thought they would probably drop Lee at a shopping center or somewhere neutral, and that she would call for him to come and fetch her. He went to the gas station, where he had left the police officer, and they waited, hoped, but no one called. The Matthews family was frustrated and felt that the kidnapper was probably holding out for the rest of the money. But he didn't make contact again. Lee's phone was off, so Rob and Sharon could not reach out to her. Everyone waited at the command center until 1 a.m. in the morning, but there was nothing. Rob and Sharon went home for what would be the first of many sleepless nights. Hours turned into days, days into weeks. Then, on the 21st of July, 12 days after Lay was taken, a municipal worker found a naked body in an open field off the R82 highway in Walkerville. The worker ran to a nearby pub where a detective happened to be having lunch. In the afternoon, it was confirmed that they had found Lee Matthews. The family was at the command center at Johannesburg Central Police Station. When the chaplain came over to speak to Sharon, he didn't have to say anything. She knew they had found her daughter and that she was no longer alive. It was devastating news. Up to that point, police were still hoping that they would find Lee alive. A month after she was found, the investigation didn't seem to be making any progress. On 24th of August 2004, Police Detective Superintendent Piet Bailevelde took over the investigation. With no meaningful leads, Bailevelde began his investigation at the original starting point, Bond University. He found a student who had seen Lee walking alone towards her car and suspected she'd been kidnapped from the parking area. Hundreds of interviews followed as he went on to talk to her relatives, friends, acquaintances, and university colleagues. Even though many had already made statements, Bilveld re-interviewed them, convinced that vital clues may have been overlooked. He visited the spot where her body had been found. He established where calls had been made from Lee's phone on the day of the kidnapping. One vital new clue emerged. Rob Matthews had misunderstood the instructions for the drop-off of the ransom money and had driven through the Grasmere Toll Plaza. This had prompted the kidnapper to shout at him, revealing his Indian accent. Bileveld interviewed Elliot Makubela, the grass cutter who had found Lee's naked body. Makubela said he had been cutting grass in the same area the previous day and was adamant the body had not been there. Forensic experts found Lee had been shot four times, had not been sexually assaulted, her toes and soles were reddened by freezer burn, two hollow point bullets were retrieved from her body. She had died more than a week before she was found. Bileveld now knew her cell phone had been used in Walkerville, and the kidnapper was probably an Indian male. Bileveld approached the Crime Intelligence Unit, who scrolled through reams of records and came up with a fit, a cell phone on the Vodacom network belonging to Donovan Samuel Moodley. They came up with his ID number, home address, phone numbers. 
the fact he owned a gold Toyota Taz and a yellow Ducati motorbike, and he had a license for a 9mm Taurus Parabellum pistol. A list of student names from Bond threw up a Donovan Moodley, whose details matched those of the Donovan Moodley they already had. Moodley had left the university in May, but had studied some of the same subjects as Lee and she could have known him. He identified 24-year-old Donovan Moodley as his prime suspect. On Friday, October 1st, Bileveld told his team he had identified his man. On the morning of the 4th of October 2004, Donovan Moodley was arrested outside his parents' home in Brackenhurst, Alberton. As he was handcuffed, he said, What took you so long? I was expecting you. The arresting team of officers took Moodley back into his home, where his parents, Stephen and Mary, were getting ready for the day. They were shocked and confused to see him in handcuffs and demanded to know what was going on. Donovan Moodley dropped to his knees as if in prayer and said, I committed a murder. I killed Lee Matthews. His parents were mortified. His mom cried, I have prayed every night for the Matthews family, why? Her son looked at the floor. He had no answer. Investigators found Lee's Tanzanite ring in Moodley's bedroom, hidden inside a CD case. They also found a disc with letters saved on it, addressed to his parents and fiancé, saying that he was sorry and that he knew he was going to prison for at least 30 years. As soon as his first session of questioning began at the police station, Moodley said that he would tell police everything. He talked them through the kidnapping and the murder. However, his version of events was riddled with inconsistencies. Either way, this is what he told investigators. Moodley claimed that he kidnapped Lee because he was desperate for money. He admitted that the idea of kidnapping had been playing on his mind. The easiest way of executing his plan was to take a fellow student and ask her family for money. In the days leading up to Lee's abduction, Moodley told his parents that he was going on a short trip with motorbiking friends and that he would return in a couple of days. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, judging by his packing list. He took with him a balaclava duct tape a blanket, as well as his fully loaded 9mm pistol. On Tuesday 6th of July, he checked into the Formula One Hotel, Santon, from where he took the 10-minute drive to Bond University campus the next morning. He had not picked his victim yet, but he knew it would be someone from college, as he felt the majority of his classmates came from wealthy families. Ironically, although Lee's family lived comfortably, they were not wealthy. In fact, they were not necessarily much higher up on the socio-economic ladder than Moodley's family. Donovan Moodley bided his time and went to Bond University campus on the 7th, 8th and 9th of July, prowling the parking lot, looking for his victim. On Friday morning, the 9th, he saw Lee on her way to her white Toyota Taz. He asked her for a lift to a nearby intersection. She agreed, the worst decision of her life. In South Africa, where car hijackings occur daily, Lee was very security conscious. She would habitually remind her family and friends to lock up behind them and lock the doors of their cars while driving. But Moodley was well-dressed, eloquent and unthreatening. To Lee, he was a fellow student who needed a quick ride, and she was on her way anyway. For Lee to have agreed to give Moodley a lift, she must have believed that he was harmless. With her guard down, she drove off and made small talk with him. According to Moodley, as soon as they approached the intersection where she was supposed to drop him off, he pulled out his firearm and pointed it at her head. He forced her into the back seat and he shifted into the driver's seat. He found an isolated park where he let her out of the vehicle. He bound her wrists and gagged her, then ushered her into the trunk of her own car. He drove back to the university parking lot where he parked next to his own vehicle. He waited until the coast was clear, then he transferred his victim into the trunk. He drove to Walkerville, where he parked in a field and waited. 
Moodley only used Lee's phone to communicate with Lee's parents. The Matthews family, together with the police, acted swiftly and were ready to make the drop on the same night. On the night of the money exchange, Lee was still in the trunk of his car, only yards away from where her dad was parked. Once Moodley had the money, he wasn't sure what to do next. He drove around for a while, looking for the best place to leave her. He knew that Lee would be able to recognize him, knowing that he went to the same university as her. He realized that he would probably not get away with what he had done. That is why he drove back to the location in Walkerville, where they waited all day as he knew it was isolated and there would not be any eyewitnesses. He opened the trunk and let her out at gunpoint. Then he ordered her to undress because he wanted to burn her clothes to destroy all evidence. He gave her a blanket for modesty and as she turned her back on him, he shot her in the back of the head. After that, he dragged her body deeper into the field and shot her three more times to make sure she was no longer alive. Then he went to an open lot in Lanasia, close to his parents' home, where he burnt Lee's clothes and belongings, as well as his own. He heard about her tanzanite ring on the news, so he went back to the burnt evidence and retrieved the ring late one night. After he took Lei, killed her and discarded of her body, Moodley went on with his regular routine, like nothing was wrong. The very night after he killed her, he went to a casino with friends. Moodley also went on a spending spree and bought what he referred to as odds and ends, explaining the one 200 do rand investigators could not trace. He bought an engagement ring with the ransom money he had taken from Rob Matthews and arranged a trip to Durban with Yashika, her sister, and her sister's husband. While in Durban, they went on a romantic sunset cruise and he proposed. Yashika said yes. Needless to say, the engagement didn't last. Moodley broke it off after his arrest, knowing he would be going to prison for a long time. He faced a mountain of irrefutable evidence. Forensic technicians retrieved two of Leigh's blonde hairs on the back seat of Moodley's car. And then there was the lottery ticket with Moodley's fingerprint found in Lee's car. Ballistics experts were able to confirm that Moodley's Taurus 9mm pistol was the gun used to kill Lee Matthews. But his story about shooting her when she turned her back on him didn't add up. Looking at the trajectory of the gunshots, Lee must have been in a seated position when she was shot. He stood above her and fired downwards, point blank. At the location where he had burnt his and Lee's clothing, police found the remnants of Lee's cell phone, her burnt ID, the underwire of a bra, part of a wristwatch, as well as keys that proved to be Lee's car keys. Forensic experts testified that the shell casings found at the scene where Lee's body was found did not match the position of her body. The type of weapon used would not have caused the cartridges to have landed next to Lee's feet when she was shot in the head and torso. Two bullets went straight through her body, yet despite extensive searches with metal detectors and ground-penetrating radar, the bullets were never found. When Lee's body was found, the lack of insect activity became vital evidence in the case against Moodley. Decomposition was slowed down by storing her deceased body in a cool place like a fridge or a freezer. There were flies or ants on her body. In an experiment conducted one year to the day after Lee was abducted, entomologists proved that flies and ants would have been present at the scene and would definitely have gone on to a decaying body yet there were absolutely no insects on Lee. That is, none except for one, a grass funnel web spider. What was significant about this find was that this kind of spider typically weaves a web and comes out to catch its prey once the web is compromised. Yet, the spider on Lee's body had virtually no webs. It proved that the spider was only on her body for a very short amount of time, not 10 days, as Moodley suggested. The case was strong, but something still didn't add up. What about the frostbite on Lee's feet? 
Why did the man who found her body, Elliot Macubella, not see her the day before? Where did Moodley keep her? Where did he shoot her? He was never able to provide an answer to this question. On the 25th of July, 2005, Donovan Moodley pleaded guilty on the three charges against him, murder, kidnapping, and extortion. At his trial, Lee's family and friends showed up en masse, everyone wearing white ribbons, in memory of Lee. Moodley had his fair share of support too, with everyone behind him wearing blue ribbons. The Reverend Stephen Moodley spoke on his son's behalf. He said that Donovan's family stood by him, but as a father, he felt responsible for his son's deeds, and his family was ashamed to be associated with a crime of this nature. Stephen said that his son Donovan did not deserve forgiveness from the Matthews family. Since the making of this documentary, Moodley has applied for parole in 2022, but has been denied. We hope you enjoyed this true crime documentary and will consider subscribing to our channel for more true crime documentaries from around the world.